Stravan Imperium, another name in the long scroll of tyranny. Their takeover of the Earth would be heralded by natural cataclysms on the planet. And heralded by supporters of other revivals from the past. To look back on the last glimmer of the golden age was not uncommon. Before the von Strava takeover, many did. the antiquity of nuclear war to finalize the end of peace. The world would come together once more to break apart. A divided world started as an idea from the East. And the West agreed to rule the Earth, while the East would rule outer space. And so explains the backwater status of the Earth in 3001. Everything else comes from outer space, from unknown regions. Humanity's life depends upon the unknown knowledge is laughable when attributed to a human being. First lights of the morning sun cut through the frost of the cold Montana night. In a dark room, the light helped touch up the features of a morning congregation. Anacreon or Agenemon thanked the forever, while Jaina Southcross took a position for the Sephiroth. The monkey messiah was his own god. He ate the body of his father and washed him down with coffee. He returned to his story about the astronaut who fell to earth. Furthermore, I blame the stoic decision that's left our world in division. Jaina Southcross, soldier of the Bikani people known as the engineers, spoke aloud. Those who say that the city of man is temporal, but the city of their god is eternal, they have the gods who run whole. They built cities, then empires to the infernal.
Anna Creon agreed with what she said, minus her pagan zealotry. Monster in hell, composer of the world state, wishing well indeed. It seemed convenient to perch on moral swells, also known as Christian hells, while generals in their masses sit like witches at black masses. This land is now led by asses. Far removed from Janus's hatred and Anna Creon's musings, a strange channeling of spirits entered the monkey messiah. He became the astronaut who fell to earth, brought back from the great sleep of the dead, a child of the great partition, all the way from the fringes of the solar system, the double planet of Pluto Charon. I was from the planet Pluto Charon. Seized power Saphon retold the first successes of her ancestors' colonization of the outer planets. This first step up in Mars. Where not a drop of rain had fallen upon its deserts in a million years.
Parasaphon went on to explain that the success of colonizing Mars gave rise for the creation of other settlements on the moons and satellites of the gas giants. At this point, the ghost of Paris Safon went on to explain the beginning of what would become the last voyage of her ship, the Agamemnon. The celestial philosophers of Pluto Charon meditated on the Doppler shifts of the light spectrum on the nebulous deep. They waited for the stars to talk to them. From Eon Frozen Charon, the message was brought across the glass bridge of Styx to Pluto. The message was transmitted into the dreams of a specially chosen space messenger. Paris Afon had the honor, and Sarabian monks tutored her the importance of the message she was to carry. You are to travel orbital junction of the Earth. There, by the time your ship and you reassemble in their time frame, an important young woman of the Earth will be courted by the Japanese Emperor of the Earth. He will ask her to be his bride. Her decision will rest on the final gift he gives her. This gift will be a second moon for the Earth. This moon will be the asteroid Ceres. Go now and escort this asteroid to the Earth. Parasaphon boarded her ram collider spaceship, the Agamemnon, en route to the planet Earth. She was prepared to rendezvous with the asteroid Ceres and escort it to the Earth. She was doing this at a point of time when the delivery of Ceres to the Earth was decades into the future, and the Empress to be had not even been born yet. This was the nature of faster than light space travel. Paris Afon lived another possibility of time, just a fraction away, in oblivion. The Agamemnon was flung away from Pluto Charon towards the gas giant planets. First on the order, the blue storm world of Neptune became the source of a diatribe by Paris Safon. She had an affinity for one of the moons of Neptune. This moon was Triton, 
retrograde satellite with lakes and geysers of liquid nitrogen. Oblivion and the Agamemnon have been flung through the magnetic fields of Uranus. Past the comet world of Chiron and into a swarm of spacecraft that preceded the massive gravity wake that was called Saturn. harbored the most forms of human and non-human life in the solar system. Human, non-human understood this. There were the Saturnian mystics who meditated with lightness through the storm bulges of the gas giant. There were the floating cities that drifted with the air currents between the floating icebergs the size of the earth. There were the mysterious humans who danced upon the spokes and rims of the rings of Saturn. And societies went even further in these specialized directions. Saturn was a dark place of intrigue. It all culminated in one place. The jewel of Saturn, one of its moons. This was the world of Titan. It 
had perpetual darkness, under which nitrogen storms and propane fleet rage to summer the fiery methane. The reason had nothing to do with the mineral wealth of the world. The fascination lies with the natural life forms that abound in Titan's nutrient seas. Its flush lagoons bathe the spectrum of viral octaves with strange helix coils, luminescent colony organisms, and superstructure reefs. Titan's life has an alien beauty and a fantastic glow of what life can become. Persephone recounted her descent to the surface of the world of Titan and into the cold ethane seas. Beneath the hydrocarbon slush, there had been a special cavern. The nitrogen darkness gave way to luminescence of coral organisms. Paris Afon did not need to see the Titan. She knew it was there watching her. The consummation of the species thus began. And suddenly it ended, and Paris of Vaughan had left the cold cavern, shaking with coital heat. She looked behind her and saw the life glow of her blood child inside the womb of the surrogate coral organisms. For a second, she had looked upon the face of her very own soul. It was a joy of loss Paris of Vaughan would remember forever. Body. I wrote the possible history 
while years passed in real time and age matched his own velocity. But I hardly know it. had our non-existent flung towards the king of planets, Jupiter. system of Jupiter's orbiting moons had been in the throes of a holocaust. Paris Stefan's real-time personality was able to understand who was behind this. It was Callisto, first in the order of the four moons of Jupiter, called the Galilean satellites. A migration had happened from the planet Earth called the Secret Declension. The rulers of Callisto were dissenters from the Earth. They were ruled by a devil, the Archduke Vescalibus. People whisper that I'm not human. I'd agree because I don't act like one. What I am is more twisted and stranger, born long ago under a much different sun. What I sleep demons crawl out from under, the gate that holds back my pain. I conceal it well with hate and anger. I wash myself in this bloody rain. When the screaming in my dungeon cease, and the halls of my castle are quiet and still, I prowl with a fear that I can't explain. It's a feeling grown into my will. The walls of my castle hang with human skins. The howls of my prey pound my brain. I, Calibus, am a thousand-year curse. The beast lives upon lands to be washed in the mad duke's bloody rain. von Straven heirs. Look at my brother and him at me. Look back into the Earth's history. We came from Max's Europe and stole America. Launched an atomic war, but still here we are. How did we fall from ruling Earth and grace? By Lucifer descending, as the Pagani say. We concede to cold blades of Hirohito's war. His assassins cut our throats to rule no more. But look at my brother and him at me. Where we are now is because of cruel history. People talked and people did, so no rulers of Earth could be clones and live. Safan now saw what she had seen and the Doppler shifts of heaven were true. With global oceans protected by a shield of ice, Europa glowed with a powerful human presence. 
this was the matriarchate. They had lived on Europa ever since the secret declension, when their ancestors had been destroyed on the planet Earth. The women survivors had used the last of their power to leave the Earth and colonize Europa. Observe the rules. Read the signs. You have entered a domain of excellence, and we can see it in your eyes. Puppy dog tails with rats and snails. That is what you will find here, and you can see in meta-females. Observe the rules. Read the signs. You've entered a domain of reverence, and we can see it nature's life, sugar and spice, and everything nice, that is what you will find here, and you can see it under the planet's ice. Why did the matriarchate insist on strict environmental control of Europa? It was because they were guarding a secret. Underneath the protective ice, there was an oasis of deep sea life. encountered the last of Jupiter's Galilean satellites. This was Io, fire world, with sulfur seas of molten fire. These surface conditions ionized the vacuum of space, and an aurora was formed of trace atmospheres. This condition was called the pandemonium effect. The trans wave that connected all the world to Jupiter had this to say about Io. It was the wild card. On the surface of the molten world, Paris of Bonds are a gargantuan city that walked on four legs. I am a walking city. I am an industrial supercomputer. I am a metropolis of robots. And other experiments. I am known as 
as an Organicon Artificial Intelligence Hive. I am known as the Roman A-double-I-O. I am known as the ruler of this fire world. Controlled from sources times two. Assemblages according to color combinations were lived out through the think tank personalities, making up the second silicon RNA showroom. This was the Vulgate Keep, the posterior intelligence hive, where computers dreamed. Parasifon rode the datum quakes of crashing interfaces. She was doing this to communicate with the AIIO. She could have gunned this by flying down to the walking super city, but she chose not to. Because of the genetically altered army of the Saurians, Parasophon had great reservations to meet these bizarre alterations of nature. Instead, she rode another datum column personality. Only once inside, she realized where she was and who she was communicating with. It was a human boy. Parasophon had met the Prince of Io, and he had much to say. heroic people in a land unseen by your eyes their lives have not begun yet they will be born when you die the inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. falling from the sky to the earth the inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. obscure body Parasophon saw the world where all conspiracies originated. She understood that the poison of war would be indiscriminate to whomever stood before its sting. At this moment, Parasophon felt this poison. The audience with the Prince of Io was over. Parasophon had now found herself back at the helm of the Agamemnon.
the Agamemnon became a lower frequency to the real-time history of the outer solar system and came about in blue ship wavelengths of the real-time asteroid belt. She came to rest in the orbit of the asteroid Ceres. She had arrived the exact time when the Japanese Emperor of the Earth would be courting a young American girl to be his wife and Empress. Forty-five years had passed what time had not seemed to move at all. And Paris Afan had traveled years in the real-time future to see the fulfillment of prophecy. She let down her heroic pretenses. The asteroid Ceres had become human territory at the time of the Great Partition. The winner had been the Yamato state of Japan. They had been the only Asian nation to stay on the Earth. By the end of the War of the Assassins and the crowning of Hirohito as Emperor of the Earth, Japan had fully recovered from the limited nuclear exchange. Japan now ruled the von Straven Imperium. Now the Japanese Emperor of the Earth had decided to bring his asteroid Ceres to the planet Earth. To accomplish this, he had to sell his soul to the devil that resided on the red planet of Mars. And these rulers of Mars then sent their hounds of hell upon the asteroid belt. Safan traveled with the asteroid Ceres as the antiquity space shuttle from the planet Earth used hydrogen bombs to blast the orbit of the asteroid Ceres and bring it to the Earth. But as she remembered, what the monks of her homeworld had said about the asteroid Ceres, Paris Afan relaxed in the glow of prophecy. to describe what she had seen on Mars in the brief time she had orbited the planet. Great changes had taken place in the desert and glacial fields of Mars. The seeds of life had blown across the dormant fertile crescents of ancient creek beds as volcanic fissures.
to breathe in the new Martian air. But I doubted that the rulers of New Mars, the reformed Gnostics, the leaders of the secret dimension, were able to breathe in any air of life. Either things that we made will overtake us or take us will take over. The new rulers of Mars, the reform Gnostics of Ares, had their origins in a splinter group from the Earth. They had created a society in the carbon dioxide polar fields and lived like perverted lords. In thrones built in triumph to mastery over the human DNA. Each sapient priest had been made a female baron to govern worlds in the solar system. A dangerous spirit ahead. If we do not stop, correct, and change some of these wrongs. They flaunted their belief that they were the temporal representatives of the universe. They used nature as a weapon. The clans Moses. The blending of the culture of the first Martians and the nations of the Great Partition stood in the way of the reformed Gnostics being lords of Mars. In the canyons of the interior they defended, and in the northern dune fields they stood their ground. But the clans of Moses could not stop the reformed Gnostics. What clans survived the destruction were coward in the surrender and servitude. But that was not the only casualty of the reform Gnostic takeover. The native life forms of Mars became extinct. Parasophon had no time to react to the attack on her ship, neither did the other spaceships escorting the asteroid Ceres. The reformed Gnostics had ordered an attack upon them. Their agents of destruction were the Mastiff Raiders from the planet Venus. They fired hyperkinetic slices at every ship within the convoy. They were instantly destroyed. Only crippled, the Agamemnon was made unable to reassemble at a particle level. This was the mortal wound. The Agamemnon would explode and Parasephon would have to escape. That day, above the planet called Mars, Survivors of genocide watched the destruction of Agamemnon. They watched an escape craft eject from an implosion ring that had once been a spaceship. This was the drop tug from the destroyed Agamemnon, heading towards the one planet that Parasephon had never been to, Earth. The lotus of the Cerebian monks was my Pluto charred home calmed my decision. I trusted them and knew only of nothingness as I drifted toward the faint gravity well of the earth. I climbed 
claims that my own life was saved, even while my mortality was not, by the knowledge I remembered, the tutoring of the Serbian monks. I heard the Stygian chants of the pastures between the Kleber and the Ord. I heard the pulsar songs of red and blue, the colors of heaven. They reminded me that innocence is lost in the presence of life's beauty, but reminded of death when heaven is fulfilled by reunion. What chances will the earth, lowercase and subjugated, take to follow its heart again? Where Parasaphant's ghost mingled with the land of the living, Parasaphant died once more in Soviet, Ohio, USA. The dead bodies of humanity. That's its only creation. Parasaphant died for a second time in a dark room of communitaria. After the tale the astronaut who fell to Earth was over, Parasaphant left the spirit of the living and returned to the land where ancestors slept in death. The monkey messiah had been a door between worlds and that door now was closed. He looked around the room. He made eye contact with Anacreon and understood the grief that was inside of his heart. He next made eye contact with Janus and understood the grief inside her heart. They both ate from the same god. and he had found it hard to believe in anything. But he was still alive, and in his old life's death, he had seen his beginning in the land of his ancestors. Anacreon made sense of the tale in this way. The monkey messiah embodied the spirit of the innocent servant lived out the mischief with his own free will. All planet Earth produces is uh, the dead bodies of humanity. That's his own creation. Anacreon had a story to grow in the soil of his past experiences, whether they be the ashes of his past disasters or not.
He understood this to be the true gift of life, and so, when the monkey messiah looked over at him and asked him what he would do now, Anacreon said he would live. Live. Next to the last sailor, the Pagani engineer known as Janus said a prayer underneath her breath. The vision she had had days ago about meeting the stranger from the Pacific had said his heart was the biggest gift that her own fate would ever meet. That was all the vision had said. For such was the importance of the last sailor that she was relieved to not know the full plans of heaven for the time being.